Thank you so much uh, for having me this evening and for uh, the applause and everything. It was awesome. Um, that, that sound effect was really cool. Um, it, it w if I had nerves, then that just kind of amplified them and made them terrible. So, um, but thank you for having me. Um, just by a little way of introduction. Uh, so my name is Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a computer programmer. I write code. Um, I do a lot of uh, open source work. Um, you might have used uh, some, of, some of my work in the past. Um, currently, uh, so maybe some, some of the stuff I've written, um, I wrote a library years and years ago, back in 2008, called Shadowbox. Any, any use Shadowbox? It's kind of one of the very first light boxes. Yeah, now they're all over the web, so you can like curse me or thank me. Uh, depending on whether or not you like them. Um, now, uh, I wrote a, a library called Mustache.js, uh, which quite a few people use. Yeah, it was a thing. Yeah. Um, and that, w so I, I wrote that actually when I was working at Twitter.com. We actually uh, rendered all of Twitter using mustache templates for a while. Um, and it was dog slow. And we, I mean, we thought we were cool because we were like, Look at all this client-side rendering stuff. This is so amazing, right? Like, it's an app in the browser, <laughs> right? Like, now we say that, and like everybody here who's younger than 20 is like, I don't get it. Like, what? <laughs> What's so funny? We have apps in the br Didn't they have Gmail? Well, Gmail was still kind of new. Um, it, was, it, was, it was still like, oh my gosh. You're like, Google Docs still blows me away when I open that up. Um, <laughs> So I guess now I'm just dating myself. Um, so more recently, uh, I've been doing a lot of work with React, a lot of open source with React, uh, work with React. Uh, I wrote uh, the React router um, together with my, my friends here uh, in the Racked GitHub org. <coughs> um, and let's see, blow it up so you can see it a little bit easier. Uh, we also work on libraries that you might have heard of, like Redux. Um, we have you know, React tabs, React modal implementations for um, you know, doing lots of common um, you know, types of widgets that you might need to do in React. Um, just by a show of hands, um, when I say React, uh, well, so there are kind of, there are kind of uh, you know, lots of different uh, levels of experience, I'm sure, in the room. How, how many people have shipped React code to production? So you're like, been there, done that. I'm on to the next thing now. Okay. Uh, how many people um, have not used React, but they just kind of heard of it? So, like the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. Okay. About as many, actually. And then the rest of you, I assume, are somewhere, somewhere in between. Um, so, uh, I make my living full time teaching people about React, about how to use React. Um, I run a business with my partner, Ryan Florence, called React.js Training. And we travel around and we hold these React workshops and teach people about React. I'll tell you about that uh, a little bit later. Um, but short story is, is, is we use uh, that business to fund our work on open source, um, to give, give back to the community. So that's essentially what our business model is like now. And it's, it's a lot of fun and we get to travel around and meet lots of people um, and, and do open source work, which we love. Um, so I wanted to kind of start off this talk um, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not actually going to talk about routing. Lots of people think, like, when I get up and give a talk, I'm going to talk about routing. Routing is cool, um, and, and, but, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff about React. Um, and so I kind of wanted to pare it back a little bit and just kind of talk about the fundamentals. Um, lots of times when people ask me, like, so, you know, you quit your job to teach people about React. Like, that's kind of a, that's kind of a big thing, right? Um, I can't necessarily say that I was excited enough about you know, anything else uh, previously in my career to actually want to like, try and start a business to teach other people about it. Um, I feel really, really strongly about React. Um, but for a long time, I couldn't figure out why I was so excited about it. All I knew was um, that React helped me get my stuff done faster, and I had more fun doing it. Um, but why? What, what was the reason why? Um, have you ever kind of felt like that? Sometimes you, you like something, but you don't know why you like it. Um, maybe, maybe, you know, some of you like got married on that premise. You, you, <laughs> like, like, I like this girl, but 
can't put my finger on it. All right. Um, <coughs> So, so let's, let's talk a little bit about JavaScript, and let's talk a little bit about, about, about kind of um, how, we, how we used to write apps, or maybe how some of us still do write apps. That's a line of code you'll never write. Right? <laughs> how, how many people in here know what jQuery is? Uh, we're we're kind of tipping the scale. Like we're kind of getting past that, right? Like some people are like, oh, Jake, that's a stupid name. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, so 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 we got this thing jQuery, right? jQuery was kind of the like original granddaddy of uh, the JavaScript sort of libraries or frameworks. Um, so I'm going to take this app element, and uh, I'm going to get this app element out of the page. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's let's. Uh, <laughs> here's another line of code that you'll probably never write. Who likes tacos? Yeah. That's right. What kind do you like? We got some uh, pollo. Got some al pastor. Yeah, dude. Uh, lingua? Is it e or i? Yeah, I never order that one. So. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. Uh, all right, all right, that's, that's enough. We can have four. Um, we got all my favorites. Oh, no, we, we're missing a, yeah, right. Okay. okay, so we got five of them in there. Okay, um, so let's say we wa we've got a bunch of tacos and we want to have like a menu, okay? We're like, we're like making a, a restaurant menu. Um, so let's, uh, <laughs> let's just like slap some HTML in there. Uh, let's see, I'll put a, a, a UL in there. Actually, I'll put a H1, and we'll say, this is the menu. And then I'll put a UL in there. <laughs> oh, gosh. My indentation within multi-line strings is, is terrible. Uh, by the way, I'm using some ES6 stuff up here, so if you just looked at that multi-line string and were like, huh? Yeah, that's what you can do with backticks. It's kind of cool. Um, so, so we got this. We got some HTML. Let's just uh, let's just save this and make sure that everything that everything works. Okay. So we've got this menu thing over here. Um, and now what I want to do is I want to list out these tacos on the menu, right? I want to tell people what, what tacos we have. So I'm going to say uh, tacos dot for each uh, taco. <coughs> uh, and then I'm just going to say um, I'll say I'll make another list item element. I'll set its text to be the name of the taco. Um, and then I'll just append that to my uh, app.find ul. Let's see if that works. OK. Got our menu. Looking good. Getting hungry, actually. <laughs> um, OK, so, so cool. So we could build this app. We could ship it. Um, um, and, and we're done, right? Um, and then somebody comes along and they say, hey, you know, um, it would be nice if we, if we had like a little button and we could like toggle the order of the menu, right? And it's like, it's just a button, right? So it should take you like 30 seconds to add it to the app, right? Like it's just a button, right? So you're like, okay, yeah, button. Uh, <laughs> so I'll have a button and then I'll say toggle uh, sort order or something, I guess. I don't know. Was it in the spec? No spec? Ha! <laughs> I guess, OK. Uh, I guess that's what it'll say then. Um, so, so when they click that button, let's see. So I'm going to say app.find the button. And then when they click it, and you're like, 30 seconds are up, buddy. I know. I'm trying to work. Uh, let's see. So when they click the button, I want to basically uh, Reverse the tacos, um, and I'm just gonna like copy these lines here. <laughs> there we go. So I'm gonna so I'm gonna I'm gonna reverse the tacos, and then I'm gonna put them back in the uh, in the menu, right? Okay. So toggle the sort order. Ah, oh, double menu. Uh, what's my problem? I need to like clear it out, right? I need to clear this stuff out. Uh, okay, so so here we go. So we could say uh, app dot find the ul right and dot empty it right. 
Yeah, jQuery. Okay, <laughs> so let's see if it's let's see if it works now. <clears throat> ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so this is actually this is a this is a pretty cool app, right? Um, we can we can toggle this all day long, no bugs. Um, so I I I I introduced something here with this line, right? Um, what is this line? What am, I, what am I expressing with this, this line, right? The fact that I had this sort of, had to do this sort of empty operation here, right? Um, because I had done something previous, right? Um, because I had already put list items in the list, and so the second time through and the third time through and every other subsequent time through, I had to kind of empty it, right? Um, and so, you know, when we're using jQuery and we're kind of manipulating the DOM sort of manually, um, even when we're using stuff like Backbone, um, lots of times we run into these sorts of little quirks and we have to like kind of, you know, manually sort of make adjustments and optimizations um, to our code. Um, there was a wise, wise man named Edsger Dijkstra who, uh, he, he, in 1972, he won the Turing Award. I won't ask who in here was born in 1972, because probably won't be very many. Okay, so uh, this is the quote that I wanted to really, really point out here. Dijkstra fans in the house? Yeah. Functional programming. Okay. He says, uh, our intellectual powers are rather geared to master static relations, and our powers to visualize processes evolving in time are relatively poorly developed. Don't worry, we'll, we'll translate to English afterwards. Uh, for that reason, we should do, as wise programmers aware of our limitations, our utmost to shorten the conceptual gap between the static program and the dynamic process to make the correspondence between the program spread out in text space and the process spread out in time as trivial as possible. Um, so you might interpret this differently, but the way that I interpret what he's saying here is that we, we've, we've essentially got two things when we write a computer program, right? We've got one version of the program that's spread out in text space, which is code, right? This is text and, and I can sort of read through this code and sort of make certain assumptions about the program, about how it's going to behave and what's going to happen when I actually run this code. Um, and then there's another version of the program and sometimes you know it's a completely different version of the program that's spread out in time, right? When you actually go and you take this code and you run it, in the browser or wh wherever your code runs, um, it might actually behave differently than, it th than you thought it was going to when you read the text version of the program, right? So we've got these kinds of two versions. One is spread out in text space, and then one is spread out in time. One is the static program, and the other is the dynamic process. And there's sometimes this gap between the two, and we call that gap bugs, right? <laughs> so we're like, <laughs> I wrote this code, and it's behaving like this, and there's a bug, and I'm not sure why, so I have to like go back to this static program and try and figure out why my, why my dynamic process is behaving the way that it is, right? Um, we actually had a little bug in our program, right? We, uh, we looked at the dynamic process, and some of you might have actually noticed, like, oh, he's just appending the same list items to the same UL, like he's going to have double stuff. Um, and that might have made you think of Oreos, which might have made you hungry, because we are already talking about tacos. Others, others we might not have noticed, right? You might have just said like, oh, that, that was kind of surprising to me that we had like double items there in that list. Um, so how can we shorten this conceptual gap? How can we make it tinier? Um, if you want kind of a more trivial example, let's, let's just blow away like all of this code. I'm going to give you a function called add. I'm going to give it two arguments, x and y. And I'm going to return x plus y. And if I, ha, here's one. <laughs> Five and four, right? Nine, OK? What happens if I, what happens if I have a var at, or z over here and it's, something random, and then every time this uh, function is called z is z times, you know, 3, did 
Did anybody predict that 11.352609 was going to be alerted? Yeah, okay, all right, you guys are geniuses. You guys don't even need this, this talk. Um, we've got this like third weird variable, right? Um, this is, this is state, right? This could be like some other state that's like coming in from who knows where. It's not an argument to our function, but now it's affecting the output of our function, right? It's this weird like side effect thing that's making its way into our program. Um, when we build up applications, when we build up, uh, in, 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 I'm specifically talking about like UI, over the course of time, when you're using that application, lots of times you'll get sort of these accumulations of state. Um, and then you'll get bugs, and, and, and lots of times the answer is uh, just refresh, right? Just, just refresh, <laughs> just unplug the computer, just plug it back in, everything, like, that's a real solution, right? Like, I still do it sometimes, right? And why? Because we've got this kind of accumulation of state. Um, and so we have to, we have to figure out how to, how to get that out um, so that we can shorten this gap between the code that we read on the page and what's actually going to happen. Um, let's take a look at... Uh, mm. So this is, uh, this is some code that, um, that we use in, in one of our workshops. Um, I've got this thing called a, a content toggle. Okay. So this content toggle is, uh, it's a really, really simple little widget. Um, so I, I click this and I, I click it open and closed. Um, I'm just going to convert this code really quick. Actually, I've got this code in a React component. Let's save some time. I'm going to comment this out. I'm going to skip to the bottom of this file. I'm going to co... Actually, I'm going to comment out. Oh, no. I don't have it. Okay. Let's step through this. So th I've got this is open variable, right? Um, if I tweak this is open variable, true. When I re-render the page, uh, the thing is going to start out open. Um, React gives us this really cool uh, component model. You know, I actually really enjoyed David's talk because he was talking about how, um, you know, creating things in like tiny components um, and then you can sort of compose them later. He was talking specifically about microservices, but I think it applies in a lot of different areas of computer programming. Um, so React gives us this, this thing called a component. Um, and this is like the building block of React. Um, so if I've got a piece of state, um, I declare that in a method called getInitialState. And you'll watch, I'm just going to copy all of this code. I'm literally just going to copy and paste these lines up here. So I've got a method called getInitialState. Uh, this method is going to return an object of all of the state um, that, that my object starts out with. Um, and we've also got a render method, which is responsible for um, rendering, the given rendering the UI uh, at any given point in time. So I'm actually going to take this code. I'm going to copy it up here. Excuse my reformatting a little bit here. OK, so I've got this render method. Um, and render is going to basically say, it's, it's just going to return this, this div, right? This thing that we're seeing on the page over here. Um, and instead of referencing this, is, this global is open variable, I'm now going to reference this dot state dot is open. OK? Um, so the component keeps its own state. Um, and now I've got this, my click handler function, which was responsible for actually like, changing that piece of state. Um, this is where, this is what I, this is the function that I call when I click on my button. Um, so I'm going to just delete, actually I'm not going to delete that, I'm going to move it over like that. There we go. Um, so we said this is this.state. Um, okay. Um, and React actually gives us a nice method that lets us combine these two operations. So in short, what we're expressing here is that whenever the state changes, whenever the state of my application changes, I want to flush those updates to the DOM, to the UI, 
right? I want to update the user interface in response to some state change. Um, React gives us this function called this.setState. Is open to be the opposite of this.state.isOpen. Um, so we don't have to do a manual assignment, and the page is automatically going to get updated um, when we render one of these components. There we go. So this is, this is more or less what it looks like to, to write a React, uh, to write some React code. Let's see, oh, what did I do? There we go. Notice something about this code, though. Um, so I'm looking at my static program, and I'm looking at this code, and I'm thinking, OK, is, is the content toggle box, is it going to be open or shut when I run this code? How do we know? Because the state is open, right? What if, I, what if I edit this variable here? And I save this file. I'm not even going to go and refresh my browser. My browser is automatically going to refresh because it's going to notice the change in the file. Is it going to be open or closed? <laughs> right? Like I, so I'm going to say true. So I'm representing my UI as a pure function of the current state of the application. Right? Um, it's. In, instead, of, instead of me imperatively going to the DOM and saying, OK, now go and add this class name here and go and like, add this div here, right? All I do is I declare a function called render, which, given the current state of the world, knows what the DOM should look like at any point in time. Um, now, you might look at this and say, well, that's horribly inefficient. Like, you're re-rendering everything. Uh, the button, the div, everything you're re-rendering um, every time the state changes, right? Um, so this is where something comes in called the virtual DOM. Let me put this thing out. Actually, yeah, this is good. We'll just have it on the bottom here. Uh, so that blue ring around my button there, um, that's something that, the, that browsers do by default, right? They give you kind of an accessibility hint, where is the focus of the, of the mouse right now. Um, notice that focus actually isn't changing. Um, if you've ever done programming like this and you've tried to like, okay, let's go and wipe the DOM and let's go and like repaint everything, like recreate all of the elements, right? Um, you, you would know that you would probably lose that focus in that kind of an operation, right? Because you would rip the button out of the DOM, then you would put a new one in the DOM, and then it wouldn't, the, the, the browser wouldn't know where the focus was. I've got this thing called a DOM listener. DOM listener is going to tell us all of the changes that actually happen uh, when we make some changes in the DOM. So if I go and I click on this button, um, you'll notice that Two things happened. Uh, we changed this attribute on this button. Um, we changed the class attribute. Um, and we also removed one node from the page. Um, we can actually see exactly what's going to happen in our render method. Uh, when state changes, this class name is going to be different. Um, and this div may or may not be in the page based on whether or not we're open. right? That is actually the minimum set of changes that needs to happen in order to reflect this change of state to the user. The fact that it is now open means we need to modify the class name and we need to insert one node. Um, so de despite the fact that we can just render everything, um, React is only going to make the minimum set of changes that it needs to make to the DOM uh, in order to, to reflect that change for us. Um, and this is super, super key. This is actually a huge, huge time sink uh, for, for making your app efficient when it's running on the web. Um, in, order to, in order to maximize efficiency, you don't want to actually touch the DOM more than once per cycle through the event loop. Um, if you're trying to manage that in your head in a large application, you're trying to manage all manipulations to the DOM, um, and only touch it one time per event loop, 
um, you're going to run into some complexity really, really quickly. Um, but if we can delegate that to another tool, if we can just say, hey, React, these are the changes that need to happen given the current state of the world, and you make them happen in the most efficient way possible. Um, that's actually a significant <coughs> burden that it relieves from us. That's a significant burden it takes off of our shoulders. Um, so now our app is just a pure function of state, and we model changes to our application UI as changes to state instead of changes to actual DOM elements on the page. Um, that's, that's virtual DOM. Welcome to the virtual DOM. Um, it's not any more complex than that, really. Um, so let's look at some more kind of interesting examples. Like, what, what does this separation actually do for us? Um, and, and how can, how, like, what, what kind of superpowers does this give us? Um, so I was building a, a, an app when I first got started with, with React. Um, ha has anybody done uh, native development in here? Who's done some native development? Yeah, some Cocoa and stuff. In fact, now that we have React Native, we can all do this stuff, right? Um, so uh, if you open up, like your, open up like your contacts app, and you've got a pretty traditional uh, UI table view, right? It's a, it's a list view, right? You've got a bunch of rows of, of people, and they're scrolling by. Maybe you have 5 billion contacts. Maybe you're super, super popular. Um, a very, very common trick that mobile frameworks, which are you know, running on these memory-constrained devices, have employed over the years is you know, they've learned that, hey, we've only got a certain amount of memory but guess what? We've only got a certain amount of screen space. Like, we don't actually need to paint 500 contacts if he's got 500 contacts. I only need to paint one, two, three, four, five, six, about 10, right? Because those are the only ones he can actually see anyway, right? Okay, so we think about this and we think about it. Okay, so, so if I wanted to do that kind of thing on the web, if I wanted to try and employ that technique on the web. By the way, there are probably some people in here who've actually tried to employ the same technique on the web. Yeah. About how many lines of code does it take? <laughs> 10 lines of code? Yeah. No, 10, 10, 10, tens. <laughs> um, so I, so I, I, I uh, there's this, there was this library, um, Airbnb wrote a, wrote a good one uh, called InfinityJS back in, back in the day. Uh, they called it a UI table view for the web. Um, and so basically what they were trying to do is they were trying to mimic this behavior on the web, right? So using imperative JavaScript code, what we want to do is we want to create a table view that is only displaying sort of the rows that are in the view. And then as you scroll up or you scroll down, you know, we're going to dynamically remove stuff from the top or the bottom because um, we want to save on, on, on uh, rendering uh, performance. Um, and it's, it's not a trivial task. It actually takes... Uh, it actually gets very, very complex, and you have to write quite a lot of code. Um, I have yet to see a, a, a list view implementation written in, in JavaScript, like imperative JavaScript, that is less than about 1,000 lines. Um, and then, of course, there are a lot of edge cases. You know, are your rows all equal height? Um, are you doing some sort of like masonry layout, right? This is, the, the problem can, can grow uh, in complexity uh, very, very quickly with different kinds of list views and table views. Um, so, so this is kind of a very common problem in, in computer science, like how do we render a big list of stuff? Um, <laughs> you'd think we'd have more interesting problems, but the web is basically for like looking at pictures, so <coughs> this is why we have this problem. Um, so, so could React help us solve this problem uh, a, a, a little more easily um, and a little more generically? Could they give us some more powerful primitives so that we can solve problems like this for ourselves a little more easily? Um, I'm going to open up. So what did we already say? We said, is, as long as we know the state of the world, all we have to do is manipulate the state of the world, and then React is going to reflect the changes to state in the DOM, in the document, right? So if I'm thinking about a list view, let's, let's open up this list view. Let's see. By the way, all of the material that I'm using tonight is uh, it's open source. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the link afterward if you want to go through this, any of this stuff. 
Okay. So let's see. So I've got this list. It's kind of a pretty list. I, I took some time to make that, so <laughs> I want you guys to appreciate that. All right. Uh, if I stick it over here, I like the pinks actually. Hot pink on black. I think it's totally cool. Okay. So if I if I uh, if I said document get element by ID or not not by ID by tag elements by tag name. There it is. Uh, if I get the number of list items uh, in this document right now, I've got about 500 of them in here, okay? Which is not a, that's not a huge deal. It's not a huge deal. Um, let's take a look at the code that we're using to render this list. Uh, so right now, it's, it's actually a really, really simple render method. Um, let's just read it real quick. Um, so I've got a couple of variables up at the top. I know how tall each row is. I know how many rows I have. Um, I know how to render a row at a given index, right? In other words, I've got this like delegate object and I'm asking it, hey, how do I render row 52? Oh, you showed me. Okay, that, that's what I need. Um, and then I basically just got this loop. I'm looping over all of the items kind of naively, starting at zero. Uh, I'm just ending at the number of rows. And I'm just going to create a list item for every single one of the items that I need to render. Uh, and then I'm just going to put them all on the page in this, in this OL thing. Um, and so, you know, if I, if I have 500 list items, it actually, it's not bad. Scrolling performance is actually, it's actually OK. Um, let, let's crank it up. Let's do 5,000 or 50,000. Let's do 50,000. All right. One, two, three, four, five. This is very scientific timing. About five seconds, 5.2, I think, <laughs> uh, to render this list of 50,000 items. Uh, struggling a little bit on the scroll, but it's OK, right? <laughs> I can ship that. <laughs> How many people are comfortable shipping that? <laughs> Let's go out for beers, man. Like, we've had enough of this stuff. Like, it's late. I don't care. 50, 000, like, nobody's going to have 50,000 items, right? <laughs> and then one of your clients is like, <laughs> we have 500,000 items. I got 16 gigs of RAM in this machine. <laughs> yeah, OK. I think we're going to get the sad tab. Uh, I, think, I think we're going to make Chrome very, very sad here with this, with, this, with this process. I don't think it's. How long does it wait before it gives you the sad tab? I guess. All right. All right. We're going we're gonna to bump this thing back down. Um, so apparently, React is super slow. <laughs> You can all go home now. That's it. That's the end of my presentation. <laughs> um, so, so what's the problem here, right? Is the problem with this list, um, is, there, is our problem React? What's our problem? That, that you're rendering 500,000 things, Clients. dude. Yeah, right? Yeah, the browsers. <laughs> the browsers should be faster, right? Um, no, I meant the, the client that you work for. Oh, yeah, the client. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Screw those guys! 500,000 rows. Yeah, OK, so we got the sad tab. Oh, snap. Um, hold on, ho hopefully we can, uh, I think we, if Chrome doesn't try and cache the bad version. No, don't cache the bad version. Oh, it's doing it again. Man, that like one process per tab thing, those guys are full of crap. Oh, wait. <laughs> OK, OK, so we're back down to 50,000, so now it takes five seconds to render again which is fine in my book. Um, so so how, do we, how, do we, how do we deal with this, right? How do we not render 500,000 rows for the client who has 500,000 rows? Can we do it? Yes. Maybe. <laughs> so what things do we need to know? What is the state of our world? What are all of the pieces of state that can affect how many rows we show? Size of the viewport. How much height do we have? Right? In this case, that's the only one that we're worried about because they're all stacking and they're all 100% width. So yeah, S height, available height, 
What, 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 what other state do we need to know? How far down are they scrolled? How many items? Yeah, how tall are they, right? Anything else? I think that's it, right? If I put, if I put those four variables, or three, into a function, um, I could then spit out the other side. Yes, you are now supposed to display item, you know, 365 through 412, or whatever, right? I could, I could narrow it down. Um, so let's see if we can do that here as kind of an experiment. Um, so let's see. I'm going to say my uh, start index is going to be, um, actually, you know what I could do here is I could just pull up the solution and save us some time so we can all get back to socializing, which we really want to do. Let's see. Render optimization solution. How about I'll put it up next to the exercise, and then we can, we can see the diff really, really clearly. This is like peeking in the back of the book, you know? You're like, ah, oh, this is really super hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so easy now, right? <laughs> Caught my son doing that the other day. I was like, are you looking in the back of the book? And first of all, I couldn't believe they had the answers in the back of the book. His school textbook, they got the answers in the back. It's like, you're not supposed to get that until you get to college. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so let's see. So, uh, so here's, here's the solution. We're going to add a couple of lines. Um, we're gonna, we need the available height. We need how far we're scrolled, right? Um, this, is, this scroll bottom variable is just a piece that we're using to track, OK, um, you know, where is the bottom of the scrollable area? Um, and then I'm going to compute. This is the key part, right? I, I want to start index and I want to end index. So I want to start at you know, item 465, and I want to end at item 512, right? Um, and then instead of looping from 0 to num rows, I'm just going to loop from start index to end index. Um, in this case, I'm adding uh, minus, plus or minus 20 rows on either side of it, because if you start scrolling really, really fast, um, you, you might start to see a little bit of white space on either side. So we're going to add a little bit of padding on either side. Um, so we're going to render you know, the rows in the viewport plus or minus 20, uh, plus and minus 20, rather, I should say. Um, and that's really kind of it. Um, it's because we have, I don't want to give it away yet. Let's look at 50,000. Now that we're not being crazy, XML version. <laughs> what in the world was that? OK, so we've got 50,000 items in our list. Or do we have 36? Buttery smooth, right? Like you can't even, I'm going to stop in the pinks because I like the pinks. <laughs> Boom. Look at that. Yeah, that's cool. I don't know. What happens if we pop in 500,000? Sad tab? Nope. Again, how many rows are we rendering? 36. So our client, who has 500,000 rows, like they're fine with that, right? Oh, I reversed scroll position. Oh, I reversed it again. <laughs> oh, I reversed. And I went over here and I clicked and I dragged the scroll bar all the way down, right? And then my text started wrapping weirdly at 428,567, right? So if you've written something like this from scratch, um, you should have like this welling up of joy almost to tears inside right now. Um, because this is actually really, really difficult to do with imperative code, right? Um, but when all you care about is what are the inputs to the function, what's my scroll top, what's my available height, watch as I decrease the available height. How many, how many, how many items do we have in the DOM right now? OK, 56. We said plus and minus 20. If I've got less available height, how many items do I have in the DOM now? 46. So I've got 6 plus and minus 20. Yeah. Um, it really is that simple, right? If I can reduce all of the, all of the, uh, the state or all of the, the questions to just what state is there. Um, and then React takes care of the time for me. So the conceptual gap 
for me, between my static program and my dynamic process is actually really, really tiny. Um, should I finish or could I take five more minutes? Take five more minutes. Five more minutes? Okay. I'm going to take five more minutes. Who wants to see another example? Okay, let's do another example. Um, so I'm going to do, uh, what is this one called? Okay. How many people have, uh, how many people know what a theremin is? Yes. Only a room of computer scientists <laughs> know what a theremin is. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's see. So a theremin is like this weird little instrument where uh, you move your hands and it plays music, basically. Uh, just YouTube it, you'll find a theremin. I don't want to take too much time on what a theremin is, but uh, the basic idea behind this thing is, is I move from right to left, pitch, and then from bottom to top is volume, although I need to make that contrast more so that you can really hear the change in volume. Um, so let's look at the code that we use to render something like this. Let's see. Okay. So right now I've got this little app. Um, and I've got, I'm all, the only thing I'm doing is I'm just rendering this div. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the conceptual gap. Can you tell when you look at this code, okay, so I've, so I've got like some imperative code in here, right? Like creating an oscillator and telling it to play and stop um, when the mouse does certain things, right? So the, the question is, can we look at this static program and, and predict exactly what the dynamic process is going to do? Can, do we know what this code is going to do when we run it? Example, is the sound playing when we first load this code into the page? Maybe. We don't know. Are they moused over it? I don't know. Is there time, right? Like, there could be. They could be moused over it. I don't know. Um, let's see if we can take this imperative code. This is a really, really direct example of going from imperative to declarative, okay? What pieces of state do we have in this app? Mouse yeah, yeah. In the mouse, from that mouse position, we're deriving um, the pitch and the volume. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stay up there at kind of that high level, right? So we've got pitch, um, and we'll just say that starts at zero. We've got volume, uh, and volume, and that starts at zero. Slipping into my German there, I guess. And then we've got whether or not uh, it's playing. Okay. So now instead of calling these uh, these imperative methods here, all I'm gonna do is set state. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then I'm just going to set some state down here. Um, I'm still going to have to do that imperative stuff uh, eventually. So I don't know. I'm just going to have this method called like do imperative stuff. Your coworkers will thank you for that one. <laughs> and then we're just going to pull a bunch of the, we're going to pull the pitch, the volume. <laughs> for some reason, I keep typing an N after that word. Out of this dot state, um, we're also going to pull is playing out of this dot state. Um, and then we're going to say if is playing uh, this dot oscillator dot play. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to stop it. Let's see, stop. Okay. Okay, so when should we do imperative stuff? Um, so React actually gives us these cool lifecycle methods um, that are for, they give us, these, these lifecycle methods are the other part of eliminating time for us, right? Um, I have this one shot right here, component did mount. This tells me, okay, the component is now in the page. We, we now put this thing into the page. This is your chance, here and now, to do something. Um, 
so we're saying, okay, so, uh, so we want to do our imperative stuff uh, right now at, at this point in time, given the current state of the world. Let's see. Okay, so, so now when we look at this code, can you tell me, is it playing? Save the file. No. Is it playing now? Sorry. <laughs> the audience is now deaf. Is it playing now? The, the, the static program is like the same as my dynamic process, right? I can look at this text and I can tell exactly what is going to happen in my app. Um, uh, David talked about composability. When we make stuff declarative like this, we get composability for free. Um, check this out. What if we wanted to refactor this a little bit? What if we wanted to have like a tone component? A tone doesn't really render any UI. Um, it's still user interface, right? Try telling a blind person that sound is not a user interface. It's still, it's still user interface, um, but in this case, it does, there's nothing visible. It's audible. Um, so let's take, let's take some of this stuff. Let's see. Um, so our component did mount. We're going to move that up into our tone. I'm literally just going to copy and paste this code. Uh, let's see, I'm going to have our do imperative stuff. I'm going to move that up into our tone. Let's see. Um, and then instead of this dot state, so the tone doesn't keep its own state anymore. The app keeps the state. And it's just going to pass that state down to the tone as props. Okay, um, so the way we render one of these tones is just going to be down here. Tone uh, this dot state. That's basically just saying, go ahead and pass all of my state as props to this tone component. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's just make sure it works. Um, so I mentioned composability, right? What's going to happen now? I'm going to have two sounds. What's going to happen now? Somebody know like the frequencies just offhand for like, it's going to be 600. It's 440. It's 440. 440 is a, a, Yeah, that doesn't really help me right now. <laughs> uh, you want to double or half to get the Oh, it's like a logarithmic scale. Yeah, I was never that good at logs. <laughs> all right, all right, we'll we'll do this. We'll do this. It's gonna be ugly. It's gonna be ugly. Just do pitch divided by two. Yeah, or pitch times two instead of. Okay. I can, I can do that. <laughs> that's math. That's times two times two, right? <laughs> I don't know. Just do times two. Oh. That's easy. Okay, okay. We're missing the point. <laughs> that was cool, right? Like, we can look at that code and we can tell exactly what was going to happen.
We're like, oh, what's going to happen? I wonder, gee, I wonder, there's three tones. Are they playing? Yes or no, right? Like, based on the state of the world, we can look at our code, we can look at the static program, we can predict exactly what the dynamic process is going to be. Uh, one last step here that's going to make this really fun. You just put all the synthesizer guys out of business. Yeah, exactly. We get component did update uh, when we get new props. This is a killer sound system. <laughs> All right, I'm ready to do the uh, soundtrack for the next Star Wars <laughs> sound effects. Um, so we can take these things. When we became declarative, we, all of a sudden, we got composability for free, right? Um, we couldn't compose that together before. Um, so this is a really, really long answer to the question about why I get excited about React. What is it about React um, that makes me a faster, better programmer? I find that this ability to predict what my code is going to do um, is actually really, really powerful. Um, it, it helps me. That just just, that, just that, that gap, that conceptual gap, right, between my static program and my dynamic process, shrinking that thing as much as I possibly can um, and giving me tools to think about my code uh, declaratively, declaratively rather than imperatively um, just makes me a much more powerful and efficient programmer. Um, so just by way of kind of wrapping up, um, we are actually, we are not hiring. Uh, because it's just the two of us, and I mean, unless you want to work for free. Uh, we actually have a couple of workshops next week. We're going to be down in Carlsbad. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about React, go to React.js Training. Uh, follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash React.js Training. Um, and if you want to get updates about what we're up to. Um, and thank you very much. Two questions. Alright. Yeah. Is there no for statement in React? For statement? Yeah, just you were using while we were Oh a for uh, yeah, yeah, you could do a for statement. Um uh yeah. Jo JavaScript JavaScript does support the for loop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Let's get dirty a little bit. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that, that was just a little CSS trick. Let's see. Um, here is our list view. Um, so here's my scroller. This is the div that's my scroller. This is the one that actually has the scroll bar. Um, and then this OL, I just stretched out its height to be the total height of all of them, right? So if I've got a scroller, and then I've got something positioned statically inside it that's like super tall. It's going to stretch it, and it's going to stretch the scroll bar, uh, make the scroll bar go. I thought you were going to ask me about like a hard question about like because you said let's get dirty. No, we can get dirty if you want. Let's get dirty! Come on, let's do it. No, no, no. no. All right. <laughs> I mean, keep your clothes on, but like we could get dirty. <laughs> No, it does. It does. It does. We we I've actually done I've actually done um, grids this way with like you know. Uh, dynamically, like resizing content, like things that are like taller or shorter or wider or fatter, like like even rows is like a really really easy table view, right? Even rows with with, with the same height. Um, but I mean, if if the principles are the same, which is why I like it. The, the the primitives don't change. What state is there and when does it change? So if I can always answer those two questions, I can make any I can I can do any kind of uh, I can solve any UI problem, right? I don't have to create a list view that knows specifically, okay, now you're doing even, even height rows, okay, now you're doing like a masonry layout, right? I don't need to accommodate all these different kind of edge cases in like one list view implementation. Um, I, I just have better primitives now, and so I can, I can think about, okay, how are the inputs different um, and, and solve problems? And I'd be happy to talk to you about crazy grids afterward if you'd like. Yeah. Okay, I think that's two. Yeah, thanks. thanks. So